for joining us. And uh, we'll go ahead and introduce the rest of uh, us that are here today. And we'll talk to Beth a little bit more in a minute here. My name is Jason Evans. I'm the missioner for missional communities here at the, the diocese. Stephanie, would you please introduce yourself and then Ellie as well. I am Stephanie Towns. I'm the missioner for congregational vitality, colon youth and young adults. I'm gonna put the after the colon since Beth and I have the same beginning part of our title. <laughs> So much mission uh, on the mission amplification team. And Ellie, you are? I am the social media and multimedia specialist for the diocese. Um, so all things internet, basically. Yeah. And everybody. And diocesan know, and grandkid, right? Yeah, diocesan, diocesan and grandkid. grandkid. Yes, yes. And, uh, <laughs> is, and uh, Alexander, our, the, uh, our support kitten, will be joining us uh, at some point, I am sure. Um, so uh, before we get started, the Mission AMP team has come up with some reflection questions for congregations. Some of you have probably gone and checked that out, but if you haven't yet, please go check that out and the other resources that our team, as well as the communications team and other departments at the diocese have made available for you. Those notes and other links and other things from this conversations that we've been having uh, will be listed at epicenter.org slash virtual church. Go take a look at those things when you have a minute, but let's go ahead and start with prayer. And Stephanie, as always, is going to be leading us. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, just share your screen and we'll go. All right, the Lord be with you. Yes, also with you. you. Generous and loving God, so draw our hearts to you, so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated to your service. Use us in all our resources, each minute of our day, each, each of our humble gifts and talents, and even our finances, as you will, and always to your glory and for the welfare of your people in and through and with the power of God. Amen. Amen. And we have a reading from Romans, which is also one of our offertory sentences in the Book of Common Prayer. I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is to your spiritual worship. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks, Stephanie, and uh, the Sistrin are included in the Brethren statements as well, just as a reminder. Um, we're going to just jump into this. Beth, thank you for joining us. Would you just introduce uh, your, yourself to, to, well, we know you, but introduce yourself to everybody else. Um, I'm Beth Vain. I am a priest in the Diocese of Texas. I served at St. Mary's as rector for 21 years before joining the mission amplification staff last year. And uh, I am missioner for congregational vitality, colon, innovations. So, yay, so that's me. What are some of the big projects you've been working on since joining the team? Um, one of the projects is creating a new initiative called Area Missioner, which is placing in underserved areas some folks that will go and partner with congregations to make us even more missional and to help make the church more vital. I've been working on stewardship cohorts, which is again, a new way of creating groups of people that work together, supporting each other and looking at the best practices for stewardship. Um, work a lot with congregations, helping them move from um, practices that may not be as healthy into being more vital and healthy. And being with y'all. Awesome. Yes. Being inspired by y'all. We're, we're so glad you're on the team. It's been fun having you as part of our team. Uh, so this week, we're going to be talking about stewardship. Um, the diocese has uh, provided a, a variety of resources around giving um, and stewardship in this online time as we're gathering virtually. Uh, and you know where to find those over at epicenter.org slash virtual church. Um, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, we're going to probably blow the, the this conversation out at the 30 foot level and then move towards granular things as well. But um, we want to talk about what we mean when we talk about stewardship mm -hmm. in this moment. So Stephanie, you want to kick us off? 
So I know you said you, you, I know you're actually working with some churches right now in a stewardship cohort and you've, you've been working with some others. So what are some positive ways you've seen churches navigate giving in these interesting and trying times? Mm -hmm. And, um, and one of the things that Jason and I have noticed is the ones that have do, done it well are the ones that tell a story around what we're doing it and, and invite people into that. So have you seen that done well in some places you want to share some stories about that yes. for us? Um, several places. And, and um, just last weekend, I was meeting with churches in the Northeast Convocation and uh, San Jacinto Convocation over Zoom. And there was some real anxiety and fear about money, which we'll talk about later. But we, as we began to have conversation, we talked about ways that we, what they were already doing stewardship in some really powerful ways, which was really about doing, accomplishing something together, which can be in a variety of ways. And so it turned out that all of, most all of them were actually having connections with each other and then connecting out with other people. One congregation, um, each person called someone they hadn't seen and just listened to what was going on, didn't talk, but just listened. And then another, then they invited another person to do that. And then as they expanded it, they particularly said, what about someone that's not in the church? Could you call them and just listen to them? And talking about that may be some of the most powerful stewardship you could do is having those connections and, and listening. So that's one way. So it's, it sounds stewardship of our time is just as important in this time. Well, yeah. But see, I think I think we really, when we think about stewardship and we put it into little boxes, and because we do that, we say time, talent, treasure, time, talent, money. And I think what we're really talking about is every part of our life. And so time is a part, talent is a part, money is a part, but all kinds of things are a part. And I think some better words for stewardship, maybe one of the best words is sharing. Another word is discipleship. And when we think about stewardship being really every way that we give or offer our lives to God. And so that could be a variety of ways. And so I think that really is, is helpful to me to think about what are the many different ways every day that I can offer my life to God? And, oh yeah, that's stewardship. I think it's interesting that you tied together stewardship and discipleship. I'm, I'm really glad you did that, but I don't know that that's necessarily um, a common assumption for all of our colleagues. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by that? What does discipleship have to do with stewardship? For me, uh, stewardship is about taking whatever God has given us and holding it with love and with care and then being intentional about what we do with it. And in part of our intentionality as Christians, we're looking to what Jesus has taught us about that intentionality of doing it. And really that's what a discipleship is, is following, um, following what Jesus has taught us to do seeking and serving Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourself as the baptismal covenant tells us to do. And so it's just one of the ways that we enact following Jesus as Savior and Lord. Mm. I love that. I love that you're starting with thinking about giving or stewardship about, uh, first and foremost, as a spiritual practice. How is this reflection of our journey with God, um, our faithfulness to what Jesus has called us to be in our lives. I think that's spot on. I'm, but I am curious about the about the online uh, yes. giving aspect of it in this moment. Um, do you have suggestions for churches and hmm. what they can be thinking about as they're they're planning for stewardship uh, this fall in this strange moment? Like, what are what are your recommendations on the on the the planning part for the actual financial giving aspect of this? So you've asked, actually asked two different questions. One is about the online giving, which is one. And then the other is about planning for stewardship in the fall. So which one do you want me to go to first? Let's, let's start with online giving. Okay. Like what your thoughts are and your, the kind of principles that are important for you right now. And then let's talk about how to plan for okay. what, what lies ahead. So one of the things that I do is that anytime I do online worship with a church or if I have a conversation with a church, I go to their website and look at their online giving and I give them some money. So I have a pretty good way of figuring out who's doing it well and who's doing it not. And because I want to give something to them. 
And so one of the things that uh, the Lilly Foundation did a year ago where it talked about giving people opportunities to give and about how we really had to pivot that almost no one came with a checkbook anymore. Almost no one came to church with money and said one of the best practices, and it's a yes and, was to set up online giving. And in the cohort last year, that was really hard for people because it costs money, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna be complicated, people can just write a check, and there was a lot of resistance. And one of the things that happened in the stewardship cohort last year was one church tried and they went, well, this wasn't hard, and they began to do it, and they began to have conversations, and so they had a leg up when we found out that nobody was coming in the building, and we needed a way to go. And so one of the things that I've seen is make sure, have someone that hasn't ever been there before goes and tries it, and makes sure that it's navigatable, and one of the things I've seen at churches is they have certainly the online giving, but they list really easily all the other ways that people can give. They can mail, they can do this, they can do that. And so thinking creatively of online giving is just one way that people give. Make sure that it's easy to navigate, but then be sure you, we have some other ways for people to give as well. I um, love that. I yeah. love that. I think that's important to, to recognize that people people used money differently these days. Everybody yes. has different practices, checkbooks. Some people aren't using any checkbooks. Some people use cash, but some people are totally cashless. Some people do all sorts of things from their, some, their phones. Some people aren't using their phones to do anything financially. And so I think that's a great point to, and I love the kind of secret shopper idea too, of having, <laughs> having somebody that hasn't visited the site before, see if they can go and make a contribution to see how it is for a first time user. That's a great idea. So what about the, the planning piece of this in, in this strange moment? What are, your, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think um, going back to what I said, where some congregations were doing things well, I think right now we have a unique opportunity to build relationships within community. And I think that's the first step is really getting to know one another and not just the people we know, but beginning to, to expand that circle. There's just our favorite people, but there's other people and begin online to have conversations, write notes, all kinds of ways that we connect and strengthen just our connections with each other. And um, I think we have an opportunity to make sure like all of our communication things are up to date and current. We have people's emails, we have phone numbers. So really getting that core connection but then to begin to look at uh, a team of people that could create a vision for what that would be. And um, one of the ways, as I already mentioned, we did is, is in the stewardship cohorts where we get three or four congregations together and we talk about what the best practices are. The least effective thing that we do in congregations is write a letter. And it's really hard for us to give up that letter, for example. So we talk about well, what could you do in place of a letter? So the other thing is begin to be aware of, of the mission that we're doing now, because people want to give to something that has meaning, and there have never been more opportunities to give outside of who we are. And so begin to look at those ways and collect those ways that we are actually connecting. So we can do a lot of pre-work right now of strengthening our community within but even more looking at how we're giving out. I know um, tr uh, the church in Crockett gathered some books together yesterday and they are giving them to schools. This is a church that has maybe 10 people on Sunday morning on a high attendance mm. Sunday. But every year they give several hundred books to underserved children in, in um, Crockett, Texas. That is something to be celebrated. That is amazing Absolutely. stewardship. And so beginning to collect pictures about that, stories about that, and then you can use that in the fall when you begin to talk, why, why would you want to share in our mission to give money to our church? I like that so much. I think that what it sounds like you're pointing out to us, Beth, is we have often made some assumptions about what the people sitting in pews are now gathering around screens um, what assumptions they are making about their duty to give. That, uh, and that's, that's maybe a false assumption at these days to, to assume that people know that there is a, 
a responsibility or a duty to give. And instead, what we need to do is we need to build the relationships. We need to, uh, we need to share with them the difference it makes to participate financially in the life of this community, to share the, the, the meaning-making work that we're doing, whether that's within the, the gathered community or in the surrounding neighborhood itself. Um, that the, those, are, those are things that are really important for us to be thinking about, about and not just uh, say to folks, hey, it's, it's pledge season again, it's stewardship season again, it's time to tell us what uh, your gifts are going to be and assume that people know the drill, uh, but rather um, express gratitude, make sure there's not any bottlenecks, that there's a, a team of people that are engaged in that work and, um, and, and, and share the vision for what the, the church is and is doing in the world. That, that's, that's good stuff. That's really good stuff. One thing that I've noticed or I've learned in my research around youth and young adults is that there's a generational difference in, in giving between young people give out of a sense of compassion. They connect with the mission, like just like you're describing, Beth. I can like I can imagine a young person like, of course I want to support young people in Crockett with books. Like, of course, and then they give out of that general that move being moved by compassion and they move out of their general and out of move in generosity out of that. Whereas older generations have given out of a sense of duty and that idea of stewardship and generosity does not connect with younger generations. So I think we need to be, be acknowledged that both of those um, ways of giving is important and there is a generational mm. divide. Yeah. I think it's all about yes and. Mm. That always additive that no, we're not gonna give up this unless it's a really terrible, terrible practice, but that we're going to be always adding so that we are always communicating in the best way so that everyone can hear. Yeah, that's really great. I, I love the transparency aspect of that too, that it's it's not just do this for because it, it is a duty, but it is also saying, here's the difference that we make by being a part of this financially. Um, I think that's a lo level of accountability and transparency that's important in our relationship to people that are gathering with us on Sundays. Also the gratitude piece afterwards is so mm -hmm. important. I remember when I have helped you with their stewardship cohort, you, you said that the most important thing that people can do in a stewardship campaign is to give thank you notes afterwards, especially to new givers. Yeah. Um, that piece of gratitude is so important, especially in these un unsettling times. Um, gratitude brings us out of that sense of fear. Um, there's actually science around that. Beth, you were just talking about that earlier. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things I've been doing a lot of reading on and it's been uh, researched a lot in the last 10 years, I'm going to give you a really easy definition because I am not a neurologist, but that every time we are thankful, every time we give, there are some chemicals that um, fire in our, may, our brain, uh, dopamine's one of them, and I, serotonin's the other. Some of us take serotonin for depression, and it gives us this feeling of well-being. And that actually, every time we do that, some pathways are created in our brain that have more good feeling kind of things. So it builds on it every time. But maybe the best thing that I've read lately is that when we are afraid, or we are anxious, Hmm, I think there's a few of us that feel like that right now, that when that happens, there's a chemical in our brain that is released called cortisol, which just makes us more afraid, more anxious, more worried. And the interesting thing is that as God would have it, when God created us, that one of the best ways to overcome those negative, bad feeling chemicals in our brain is that when we give thanks that those neutralize, so to speak, those negative things. And so that if we're feeling anxious or we're feeling worried, maybe the best thing to do is write a note to someone, bake a bread of bread, bake some bread and give it to someone, or just say thank you to God or think of something we're thankful for. That that actually chemically helps depress those, those, the chemicals that are being released when we're afraid. So I mean, like what a gift that every time we invite someone to give, we are actually helping to, to change the way that they think and the way that they feel. And especially in churches, we get really worried about not having enough, which is a whole nother sermon. But that when we get into that feeling that the best thing we can do is find a way to be grateful or thank you, say thank you, because then it begins to neutralize that. So good. Um, 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. So good. Um, I, I'm 100% on board with that. But in this time, people have lost their jobs. There oh. is real financial um, issue. So how, how do we navigate that asking for money when people, there are people that understandably, you know, don't have their jobs, don't have money to give. How, how, do, how are church, have you found, seen churches navigate oh. that well? I've seen it done really well. One church, uh, when they got to the auditory part of their online service, one of the things that they did, they just immediately addressed the people that were hurting in the community, that they knew they didn't have enough. And they actually, this church flashed on the screen an email address that if you needed help, you could email them right away because the church wanted to try to support you. And so they acknowledged that and just, you know, really it was so kind the way they did it. And then they invited, and I think that's the word inviting. And I think the word share, because those of us who have enough are invited to share with those who have less and invited those who were able to share and to give. And again, it was really concrete about the way that it was so kind about that. The other piece that I would think about doing is that even saying, and if you don't have money to give, can you give by praying? Can you give in another way to let everyone know that everyone, everyone has something that is of value and to give? And frankly, right now, I think I'd like prayer just as much as I'd like money. Yeah. That's great. I love hearing that. I think that, I think one of the things that we're addressing in this moment is, it was not only how do we uh, create the content that we need to put online for worship, how do we, how do we put, how do we make worship available to people, um, but then how also do we, how do we craft community in doing that as well in this way that is so foreign and different for many of us, We're not as foreign as it used to be because we've been doing it for so long now over this last month and some, almost two months now it seems, um, but that what you're talking about there is one of the things that we can actually do to facilitate not just um, a, a, a piece of content that's put out there in the world, but some a way to facilitate community with people and help bridge some of those connections between individuals. I love that. I think that's really important to be reminded of. Do we have any other questions that we, we want to run by? Beth or Beth, is there anything else that you want to share before we close today? Well, I invite you to be part of the stewardship cohorts. And actually, I guess we could even have people outside the diocese now since we're doing Zoom. Um, Tell us a little uh, bit more about that. How can people find out more information? Well, at the very beginning, I think you said to go to um, epicenter.org and um, actually I wrote it down so that I wouldn't forget. Go to Congregational Life. And then underneath Congregational Life, right at the top, there's stewardship. And you click on that and it will take you to a fabulous video made by, hmm, Ellie, um, uh, some testimonials from our stewardship cohort last year of how it changed their lives and changed their congregations. And then my email below that, and just if anyone's interested in that, there's some, some guidelines or whatever, how are we gonna do it, have creating a team and things like that. But we're finding a new way to do it virtually. And I wanna thank the Northeast Convocation in San Jacinto, which helped us pilot a new way and go through a whole nother way of doing stewardship cohorts last weekend. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Beth, for, for doing this. We're really grateful to not only being your colleague and working on the same team with you, but taking the time today to share this on the Lunch and Learn, too. It was fun. Thank you. And thank you all so much for creating this. It's such a great break each week. Yeah, I think it's fun. It's been, it's been fun. Any other, any other announcements, Ellie, Stephanie, that we should get to before we end our time? I think we're all set. I learned cool. a lot. I hope that other people learned a lot too from watching it. Um, and then this video will be available not only on our Facebook page, but on our um, YouTube channel. We have all of these videos stored there. And you can go find more resources at epicenter.org slash virtual dash church. Awesome. Thanks. As Yes, as always. Uh, friends, next week, Susan, Suzanne Smith uh, at Grace Church in Alvin is going to be joining us to talk about pivoting programs during the social distancing. So please tune in for that. We're, we're really looking forward to talking with Suzanne. Um, 
I'm, I'm saying it correct, right? It's not Susan, it's Suzanne. Yeah, it's Suzanne, Suzanne Smith and her uh, outreach coordinator, Ed Corette, will be joining us too. So we'll have a That's fun right. team, team lead yes. discussion. That's right, teamly times. All right. All right, Stephanie, so we're... yeah, close us out. All right, so three reminders, as always, follow the CDC guidelines, follow the bishop's directions, and when in doubt, do no harm when attempting to do good. As Ali mentioned, the notes and links for the reflection questions and all of the previous videos are available at epicenter.org.